Hello, happy new, happy new Year! Oh, we've not seen each other in a long time. It feels like I'm coming back home for the first time. You all look amazing in this new year. If you don't mind, just raising up to your feet as we get ready to start tonight. Who is ready for tonight? You know what, I feel like I, I, I left 2023 and entered 2024 in, into a new home. So I want to ask you again, who's ready for tonight? Yeah. yeah. I'm back home for sure. You know, as I spent time with the Lord, especially be, be, before the new year started, and I saw Apostle John uh, preach from the inspiration of the, of the Holy Ghost, he mentioned that this is the year of the outpouring. The year of the what? The year of the what? Look at your neighbor and tell them my cup is running over. In fact, the oil on my head is so immersed with his glory that it's impacting you. Tell your neighbor, I'm impacting you. What God has given me is impacting you. You know, I'm here for the Davids. I'm here for the Davids. Do I have any Davids tonight? Do I have any King Davids here tonight? Come on, do I have any King Davids here tonight? I'm here to tell you that you were anointed in your mother's womb. Your anointing is not, is not qualified by this pulpit. You were anointed in your mother's womb. But David, I'm here to tell you, your biggest challenge is in this. Your biggest challenge will be your, destiny, your journey from there to here. This year, you know, I felt a strong burden in my spirit from the Holy Ghost that we need to help our church. God went to me, Clapton, 2024 is not a year of events for you. It's a year of serving your church. So this year, who's ready to serve the local church with me tonight? Yeah, yeah. The Bible says everyone wants to be King David, but no one wants to do what David did. David took the unqualified people and he made them into mighty men of valor. Oh, Baba said, Oh, Father, tonight release your grace, oh, your grace of power. Your grace to walk in signs, miracles, and wonders. Your grace of glory over your children here tonight. Begin to speak in the Holy Ghost. Say, God, I'm ready for what you got for me this year. Who's ready? Who's ready for the more? Who's ready for the more? Who's hungry? Those who hunger, those who thirst will be filled. Oh, the Baba said, Fill up your church. Fill up your people tonight. We will go, Lord. We will go. When you go, I will go, Lord. Send me. Who will go? Who will go tonight? Say, I will go. 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 Tell him. I will go. I will. Tell him. I will go. Oh, just lay your hands on your belly right now. Lay your hands on your belly right now. Father, stir up a new well. Stir up a fresh well, a fresh wind, a fresh fire. I speak to the rivers of the living waters inside every single one of you. And I say, burst, come alive. Thank you, God. Thank Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your name. Thank you that you chose me. Thank you that you choose me. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. I'm Father. You know. Tonight we have the pleasure of having the man of God, Mr. Steve Apple. May we honor him by giving a loud, wonderful applause to welcome him into our home. 
We welcome you, sir, whatever you are. We welcome you. And also, we have the pleasures of having the Sheelys and the band and the crew. You know, let's welcome them tonight. And lastly, before I go, I welcome you all tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.
there's none like Jesus. There is none like Jesus. There is none like Jesus. Oh, he's so good. I won't forget all your benefits. I will trust the Lord. I will trust the Lord. I won't forget all of his benefits. My hope is in the Lord. My trust is in the Lord. I won't forget all his covenant. I will trust the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. I enter in to our covenant <laughs> all my hope is in the Lord on high I trust you Jesus Christ I won't forget all your benefits my hope is in your name I trust in Jesus name So we sing, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, 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 precious Jesus, 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 precious Take a minute and thank him, friends. Oh, thank him. Thank you for all that you've done. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. Here you go, lifting my load again. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. Go lifting my load again. Yeah. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go lifting my load again. He's the lifter of your head. Take a moment to remember who God is and who I am. There you go.
look up, we look up. You're the lifter of our heads. Shaking off the old. Thank you for the blood. Thank you. Jesus, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. can watch. Sing it over. What can wash? 
soir
Everything changed. It's getting harder to recognize the person I was before I encountered Christ. I don't walk like I used to. I don't talk like I used to. I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the inside out.
striving for acceptance let me tell you it's only by the blood it's never been about deserving or earning it's a gift that's freely given let me tell you it's only by the blood sing that again it's never been about performance perfection or striving for acceptance let me tell you it's only by the blood it's never been about deserving or earning it's a gift that's freely given let me tell you it's only by the blood does anybody It's only by the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's only by the blood. Could have only been the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it was the blood. Could have only been Could have only 
Never been about performance or perfection. We're striving for acceptance. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. Yeah. It's never been about deserving or earning. It's a gift that's free to give. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. It's never been about performance. Or perfection, or striving for acceptance. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. It's never been about deserving or earning. It's a gift that's freely given. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. Church, worship him. Hey, It's only by the blood. Does anybody want to be holy? Righteous. Glorified as father. Let me tell you. It's only by the blood. Does anybody want to be holy? Just the fire in the name. Let me tell you. It's only by the blood. The blood. The blood. Thank you for your blood. The blood, the blood. Washes us clean. The blood that sets us free. The blood that makes us whole. We thank you. That the blood has not lost its power. That the blood still carries power to set every captive free. The blood still has power to heal your sickness and disease. The blood still has power. We plead the blood over this region tonight, Jesus. We plead the blood over this city tonight. We plead the blood over Wimbledon tonight. We plead the blood over this house tonight. We plead the blood over every life in this room tonight. There is power in the blood. 
the blood, the blood, the blood. This is how we overcome, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood. Hallelujah. Can you give the Lord a clap? Come on, can you give him a shout of praise in this place? If you're grateful for the blood, then someone needs to praise him. If you're grateful for the blood, then someone needs to show him. We don't take it for granted, Jesus. We're grateful for the blood of Christ. We're grateful for the cross tonight. We're grateful for your nail-pierced hands. We're grateful tonight. We honor the blood tonight. We honor the sacrifice tonight. We join heaven tonight. And we worship the Lamb. The Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. We worship the Lamb tonight. Receive the reward of your suffering tonight, Jesus. Receive our worship tonight, Jesus. His hands still bear the scars. And the blood still flows in heaven. We will never get tired of giving him praise for what he did for us. We will spend eternity declaring he is still the lamb that purchased our salvation. If it was not for him, we would be lost for eternity. If it was not for him, you would never be good enough to go to heaven. You hear me tonight? You can never be holy enough to go to heaven. It's only by the blood. If you believe that tonight, then just tell the person next to you. He loves you. Tell them it's only by the blood that you're here tonight. You'd be lost in sin if it was not for the blood. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood. Give someone a hug. Give them some love. Welcome them to the house as you take your seats tonight. Hallelujah. Jesus. I can come down a bit. Hallelujah. If you've got your Bibles, just come with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, and we're going to read from verse 12. When you get there, say amen. amen. If we can get it on the screen as well. Revelation 12, verse 12. It says this, it says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now, you may have thought tonight that you were just coming to another service. But can I tell you tonight that you came to a battle? 
I said it last night, but don't just attend, contend. We're not here to attend another meeting. We're here to contend in the realm of the spirit for something to shift over this region, over this nation, over your lives. We're not here for another good time in church. We're here during these seven days of prayer and fasting to contend in the realm of the Spirit that something from heaven would be established upon the earth. If you believe that, say amen tonight. We're not here to play church. If you want to play church, you're in the wrong building. You want to play religion, you're in the wrong place. We are here for war. Let me say that again. Some of you are still asleep. We are here for war during this week. We're going to see something shift. And our scripture, Revelation 12 and verse 12, I don't focus on the fact that the devil has come. I focus on the fact that his time is short. Can, can I declare to you tonight the devil's time is short? Who knows he's about to get the final call that his number's up. His time is over. In fact, the verse before it, in verse 11, it says this is how we overcome. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I'm tired of believers being scared of the devil. I'm tired of believers being worried about an enemy who was defeated by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you tonight, we need some revelation in this place of where the devil is. I want to tell you, he is not seated in heaven with God. He's been cast down to the earth and he's been placed under our feet. If you believe that tonight, then someone needs to rise up in their authority in this house. Isaiah tells us that the day will come when the unveiling will take place and we will look at the devil and say, is this really the one? When you see him for who he is, you'll see he has nothing. You will wonder why on earth did we give him the weight that we gave him? You are greater than the devil. I, I, I hate that little picture on the internet of Jesus wrestling with the devil like he's an equal. It is not the case. God is the creator. The devil is the created. And you have been placed higher. Are you with me tonight? You have all authority. And so we're here to contend tonight. That's what we're doing in the realm of the spirit. That's what we did last night. Who was here last night? Give me a wave. Did you receive something in this place? And tonight we go again. We're honored to have Steve Upper with us. Just give him a round of applause. <laughs> Steve has been a good friend for many, many years. He came into my life in a season when I was in transition. And I just want to thank you publicly for that season where you were a voice of wisdom to me and Mama P. And we just honor you and love you. And it's an honor to have you with us tonight. Will you give him one more round of applause? <laughs> Everyone say power surge. Power Who's ready for the surge? Yeah. Who's ready to receive something from heaven? Yeah. Let, let, me, let me read you the definition again. This is what Wikipedia, not the Bible, I'll get it right tonight. This is what Wikipedia says. It says that a surge is a sudden, powerful, or upward movement, especially by a crowd or by a natural force such as the tide. Flooding caused by tidal surges. Everyone say surge. I spoke last night about an electricity surge. Do we have any lightning bolts in this place? Has anyone been struck yet in this house? Do we, do we have any conductors in this place tonight? We're not insulators, we are conductors. Uh, and my prayer has been that 
whatever surge protector you've placed on your life to shield you from the power that it be broken off you during these three days. Whether that's religion, whether that's sin, whether that's anything that's holding you back, I'm believing God that whatever you're trying to hold back from God, that the surge is going to get you during these three days. But can we talk about a different kind of surge just for a moment? Can we talk about... A tidal surge. This is what Isaiah, the prophet, wrote in Isaiah 59, 19. He says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall raise up the standard. Can we get that on the screen? Isaiah 59, 19. Now, here's the problem with our translation. You see, Jewish rabbis tell us we've got it wrong. You see, we've put the comma in the wrong place. You see, it should read, when the enemy comes in, comma, like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Everyone say surge. A flood surge. I can't promise you that the devil will not come in. But I can promise you this. Whenever the devil comes in, the Lord already has a plan. The Lord always has the final say. Can I tell you tonight that God is always one step ahead? Whether you acknowledge it or see it tonight, some of you, you may have been doing everything right. If I had more time, I would show you that even when you do things right, the enemy can still come in. But I want to tell you, all things work together for good. And there is a surge that's about to come. There's a flood that's about to come that's going to cause the enemy to flee in every other direction. Can you say amen? Amen. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14 says this, or if you prefer the American as we were taught last night, Habakkuk (laughs) 2, 14. It says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Everyone say surge. We're ready for a surge in this nation. That's what's going to happen. This is the end times. I don't believe an end time theology that says the church is going out with a whimper. I don't believe an end time theology that says Jesus is going to come back and there's going to be a few chosen, a few 144,000 or whatever the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. I don't believe that. I believe that the day is coming where the water of the knowledge of God will cover the earth. I believe that there is a great end time revival about to take place. And can I prophesy to you tonight? I believe now is the, the time for London. Now is the time for the UK. Now is the time for a surge of revival in this land again. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Yes, darkness is going to increase, but can I tell you when the darkness increases, so does the light. Psalm 47, verse 1, it says this. It says, clap your hands, O ye people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. Let me say it again. Clap your hands. Okay. Shout unto God. I said, clap your hands, O ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You see, praise is our weapon of warfare. Yes. 
Praise is the key that unlocks doors in 2024. Praise is the key that's going to unlock this region in 2024. You see, we don't fight an enemy that we cannot defeat. If you read your Bible, I've even tried to preach it in these last five, ten minutes. Can I tell you tonight, we don't fight a fair fight. We fight on the winning side. We fight on the winning team. That's why the writer, King David in Psalms says, Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of what? Triumph. Clap your hands, oh ye people, shout unto God. Some of you need to find your shout tonight. I want to tell you the walls are going to come down. I want to tell you if you'll find your shout, the enemy's going to come down tonight. If you will shout, your family's going to get saved tonight. If you will shout, there's going to be breakthrough for you tonight. If you will shout, hey, when the enemy comes, Whoa! The Lord comes like a flood and raises the standard. Just tell your neighbor, get ready for the surge. Father, I pray tonight that even as we sit in this atmosphere tonight, that things will begin to change in our lives. Father, I pray for tonight that angels will be released from this building. For every unsaved loved one, we pray let angels be sent forth from this house right now. That even when people return home, that they would speak to husbands and sons and daughters and find that salvation has come to their house. Father, I pray tonight that you would have the final say. In every workplace, the Lord says, I have the final say. In every situation and argument, the Lord declares tonight, I have the final say. It's not going to be an opinion of man, but God says, it's my opinion that matters, says the Lord. For I have the final say, says God. I have the final say in this nation. I have the final say in government. I have the final say... And he always has a plan. Father, we thank you. It's not over till he says it's over. Hear me tonight. I don't know who I'm prophesying to. You're watching online. I I tell you, it's not over till he says it's over. He has the final say, and if you will find your praise tonight, then I want to tell you, you're about to see the God of the turnaround show up like never before. You're about to see the God who makes all things new again. Just tell your neighbor, flip the switch. Get ready for the power surge. Amen. That was my offering message. (laughs) Can we put the details up on the screen for me? If you want to sow tonight, then I want to encourage you, as we start this year with seven days of prayer and fasting and these great three nights of revival, let the Lord lean on you to sow into your year. Bible calls it a first fruits offering. First of the year, something that's going to bring pleasure to him. Showed you last night, but we, don't, we can't buy the things of the Spirit. The anointing is never for sale. We can't sell handkerchiefs or, or buy miracle work water online. That's not how it works. I, I've seen all sorts of abuses over the years. So 1,000 and you'll get an anointing. Complete and utter nonsense. I've heard of churches that have put ATM machines in the back of their churches. This is in London, in case you're wondering where. And people are told to get money before the preacher will pray for them for their healing. I tell you, you can't buy the anointing. The anointing is never for sale. But we saw in Acts chapter 10 that your giving can get God's attention. Not about the amount. In fact, 
One of the greatest offerings in the Bible was a widow who gave a mite. But yet it still got God's attention. Why? Because it was not about what she gave. It was what she gave out of the capacity of what she could give. The size of your offering is not the important thing. The measure of faith it takes to sow, that is what matters to God. Can I encourage us, 2024, to stretch our faith in this area? Some of you are going to sow seeds beyond what you've ever sown before. I don't want my giving to be the same as 2023. Anyone else with me? Inflation's going up. Interest rates are going up. Maybe it's time that our giving starts to go up. I'm not phased by those things. My, my resource is the Lord. Do you believe that tonight? And so, Father, I pray tonight as everyone sows, whether it be tonight or during these three days of revival or even over this month of January, God, I pray that you'd give a seed for every person in this house to sow into the work of your kingdom. You give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And so, God, we pray, move our faith tonight that we would move heaven even as we sacrifice, not just with fasting and prayer, but by giving and pouring out for your kingdom. Father, we thank you that you're a faithful God. And we pray that even as we sow into Steve and his ministry and the other guests, God, I pray that it'll be multiplied back to us and back to this house and back to them, that there'll be divine provision for every speaker and every worship leader. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Come on, give the Lord a clap. Thank him. We'll also put the baskets like last night just on the door. We won't pass them around, but if you want to give on your way out, you can do that. Well, it's my privilege to introduce him to the stage. I want you to stand as he comes to preach tonight. Steve is a man of God that's respected across this nation. He's a voice into many denominations. He's a voice into many leaders. He's a preacher's preacher. And he is someone that I respect as an apostle here in the UK. And so will you give him some love as he comes to preach tonight? <laughs> Pastor Steve Uppel. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Wow, you may be seated. It's an absolute delight to be with you. And um, yeah, it's been a while, John. 2016, 17, somewhere around about there. So, Father, we love you. We acknowledge you. We acknowledge you in this space, in this room. We acknowledge you at the beginning of the year. We thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are supreme. We declare that you are Lord, that there is none like you. We thank you that you are the eternal one, that you sit above the circle of the earth. We welcome you into this place, into our hearts, into our thinking. Be Lord here. Be Lord at the beginning of the year. Would you arrest all of our focus, our attention, our thoughts? And in the name of Jesus, that there would be stillness wherever there's confusion or agitation, that there would be the shalom of God. Thank you that, Lord Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. Thank you, God Almighty, that you are Jehovah Shalom. It's not just a name. It's an active part of your nature. When you come, your Shalom invades that space. All chaos leaves. Everything comes into alignment. We see clearly. Things that are missing are supplied. We thank you. That's what it means to be Jehovah Shalom. And so even before we open up your word, I pray over every person in this room, I thank you that they are precious to you. Their lives matter. I thank you that they were born into the right generation at the right time, into the right body. I want to thank you that you love them. 
And I pray that they would feel your wraparound presence, your love, your peace, your rest. I pray that they would be aware of you and in being aware of you, that every thought about themselves would come into the right place. I thank you that we only see ourselves correctly when we first see you. We only see our circumstances correctly as we look up to who you are. So we love you. And Holy Spirit, I ask for your help. Thank you that you are here, that you are the helper. Thank you that you are the teacher. Thank you that you are the guide. Thank you that you are the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel. Thank you that you bring might, strength on the inside. Thank you that you are the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So we acknowledge you in this room, in this space, and we ask you, fill this space. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you know, the name of God, Jehovah Shalom, was first revealed to Gideon. In Judges chapter 6, the story is that the Israelites were impoverished. The enemy had stolen much. There was chaos in the land. For seven years... The Midianites and other Eastern peoples had come into their land, stolen their harvests year after year after year. They were hiding in the clefts in the mountains. They were trying to get their wine presses and stuff working, and, but it was all confused. It was all disordered. There was a lot of lack, and there was a lot of misunderstanding and misalignment. And I think round about verse 7, it says, and the Israelites called on the name of the Lord. They waited seven years, and then they called. <laughs> and when they called on him, he sends a prophet to them, eventually raises up Gideon. He explains through the prophet that they're in trouble because of their disobedience. Their disobedience is what has led to the chaos that they are experiencing. How many know God is good? He's orderly. He's a gracious father. He's very compassionate. He's long-suffering. He has created us to thrive in life, but every one of us has choices. Decisions we make, things that we say yes to, things that we say no to, things that we hear preached, but we make a decision whether I'm going to align my life with God's word or just hope for the best. Easiest thing in the world for Pentecostals. I've been raised as a Pentecostal my whole life is to say amen and do nothing. <laughs> to get excited in a building, but leave and live with the same sin that we've always lived with. And then we wonder why the conference didn't change our lives. It's not meetings that change our life. It's revelation that's obeyed in relationship that leads to transformed lives. Now, you don't obey in your own strength. The Holy Spirit comes in. He empowers you to live the life that he calls you to live. I mean, it's like cheating. You say yes, he says, let me help you. But the problem is many people don't say yes. I mean, they say yes to the sermon. They say the amen. But the radical obedience of a Christ follower is not accepted by the majority of people in churches. We have pet things that we want to hold on to. Even little pet demons. Self-pity, lust, anger, jealousy, gossip, selfishness, selfish ambition, 
and they stay around our lives and we're unaware that they're spiritual strongholds from which the enemy lives and operates within our own families and lives. And we can shout all we want, but if our lives are not orientated towards God's word and aligned in obedience to what he is saying, we will not see the breakthroughs we want. Or they will be short-lived and the what, you're going to break through, but you don't change your lifestyle. Jesus said, if that spirit comes out, goes around, comes back, finds the house cleaned and swept, he brings others with him. <laughs> Worse than himself and says, hey, found a clean house. Let's all come. Live here. So obedience is really important. In Judges chapter 6, it was obedience that led to Jehovah Shalom coming. So Gideon had the revelation in verse 22, 23, 24 of the Lord coming as Jehovah Shalom. And that means no chaos, nothing missing, nothing misaligned, everything in order. Shalom isn't just it's a quiet room. Shalom is everything gets put back into its rightful place. And if there's been any lack or anything missing, it's restored. So nothing is missing. So at the beginning of this year, you might want to think, Lord, the, the Israelites had seven years of lack and being impoverished, not because God was bad, not even because the devil was having a rampage, but because their disobedience opened doors that should not have been opened. And isn't it interesting, as soon as the Israelites cried out to the Lord, the Lord sends them a prophet, gets them back on track, raises up a deliverer in one chapter. He doesn't make them pay for it, like, hey, you repent for five years and maybe I'll come and help you because you were seven years in disobedience. He comes straight away, but it just took them seven years to ask for help. Maybe there's things in 2023 or two or 21, or maybe there's something in 2005 that still has an attachment into your 2024. No matter how much you confess or how loud you shout or how many people lay hands on you, there are some things that you have to decide, I'm cutting that thing off. I'm not gonna allow it to stay anymore. And so, yeah, my prayer would be that you would embrace God as Jehovah Shalom at the beginning of this year. It's not the only revelation of God for 2024, but maybe this evening you're saying, Lord, I want to know you as Shalom. That when you come, whether it's in my marriage or my family or my ministry, there is no lack. Everything is supplied. Where there's been confusion, disorder, and I've been disorientated, you're going to bring it all into alignment. It's what he does when he shows up. And so it's a good question to ask when things are misaligned, Lord, is there something I need to do? <laughs> are you waiting for me to deal with an issue? Is there anything unresolved that needs to be resolved? I hadn't planned to share that. I just Maybe the Lord wants us to hear it. I am going to preach in just a second. Um, uh, my wife isn't here with me today, but my youngest son is here with me today. He's going to stand for you. This is Judah Benjamin. He's 18. He's the youngest. I have four. Two of my kids are married. I'm a granddad. I, I'm the fittest granddad you'll find. And so we have a, one of our joys is just watching our family grow and uh, growing the things of God. So Judah's traveling with me uh, this weekend. But my, me and my wife, we wrote a book together that came out a year ago. It's called Revival Ready, Rethinking Kingdom, Discipleship, and Church. And I may touch some of this this evening. I'll see how the Lord takes me. Uh, it's the first time we've written a book together. I, I have four books I've written by myself, and this one we wrote together 
And it, it's really helping God's people to get ready for what's coming. We are in the beginning of... I, 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 I've got like three sermons ready, and I'm asking the Lord, which way do I go? The last four years of my life, we have never had so much revelation, so many downloads from the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm 50 this year. Thank you. My year of jubilee. Amen. And I've walked with the Lord since I was five years old. I started preaching. I was filled with the Spirit at eight. Started preaching when I was 13. Started a ministry at 13 called Christian Warriors. And so I've traveled to more than 40 nations, done all kinds of things. But the last four years of my life have probably been the most dramatic, more revelation, more understanding of the kingdom, and a greater realigning to what God is calling us to be and then to do. And a deliverance from Western Christianity. I, I was caught up in Western Christianity, and the Lord four years ago spoke ever so strongly to me and started to pull me out of some of the mindsets that I had been raised in. So I might talk about that in a moment. But so at, through that, the first three years of that, many of the things that the Lord was saying to us, the pruning that we went through, the forming of new wineskins, because we're all expecting new wine to be poured out. But Jesus told us in Mark 2, new wine cannot be poured into old wineskins. A wineskin is a structure, a vessel to hold the new wine. And yet, many of us are crying out for revival, but we are not paying attention to the wineskin. And Jesus himself said, you might call yourself new wine, you might pray about new wine, you might write songs about new wine, you might cry out for revival, but actually, if the new wine comes and the structure has not been reformed, ready for the new wine, both the wine skin will be broken and the wine will be spilled. Two things will happen. But if we have a new wine skin, then we are prepared for the new wine to be poured into the new wine skin, and the new wine skin has the ability the new structures, the new vessel to hold what God is about to do. And the last four years, one of the primary reasons of what we, the, the dismantling, replanting, pruning, realigning, recalibrating, it's been the most painful four years of my life. The main reason is because we're in the midst of a reformation, we're in the beginnings of revival, It'll be bigger than anything anybody has ever seen before. So I'm, I'm really not trying to get you excited. I'm quite happy to keep preaching. So let me go for a while. And if I say something that really gets you excited, you can go for it. Um, but yeah, I'm really not into hyping anybody up. I believe this to the core. I really do. I'm not saying any of it to get a response. I'm just helping you to understand. I believe my whole life, your life, you were born into the right year. You were born into the right age and era. And it's primarily for the move of God that's coming. So you could have been born 200 years earlier, 100 years earlier, 1,000 years earlier, or 1,000 years from now. But the Lord wanted you alive at this time. You are not an accident. It's why the enemy contends so much. You're an accident. You're no good. Um, you, you, there's no space for you. You don't have a calling. They're all lies. The Father made no mistake. He birthed you. He knows when he wanted you alive and what he wanted you to do. Some of us may be slightly off course and we need to get back on course. Some of us may be living with attitudes that need to change. That's okay. The Father's big enough to, big enough to help us to do that. So the last four years is, for me, it's been about my own life, my marriage, my natural family, our church family, getting ready for what God is about to do. And um, I really could spend two or three full days with you just explaining the last four-year journey. And the last four years fits into the previous 40 years. In terms of, I suddenly saw threads all the way through my life, 
and that the Lord had been saying and doing things for years. I just never connected the dots. And then as you spend time in prayer and you spend time pondering, and when the Lord strips you so you have nothing but him, then you're like, oh. In that space, he begins to make his people. I'll just give you this as a freebie. Anybody that God has ever used, he has taken them through a desert or a wilderness or a prison. Um, Between the promise and the promised land, there is normally always a wilderness. And the wilderness is there to prepare God's people for the promise. Um, But most people lose their way in the wilderness. They decide to take things into their own hands in the wilderness, manipulate their way through. I'll force this to happen. I'll make a decision. Very few people can buy time, wait for the hand of the Lord. David, when he didn't kill Saul, was biding time, waiting for the timings of God. Joseph in prison, not defending himself, was waiting for the timings of God. Jesus, for 30 years, you imagine this, 30 years of carpentry, being a faithful son, being a faithful brother to brothers and sisters, no ministry, no miracles, no teaching, for 30 years. Took nothing into his own hands, waited the Father's timing, and learned obedience through what he suffered. But he was growing in favor, he was growing in stature, he was growing in authority, but it was all in the secret place. And I see ministries and people today take things into their own hands, manipulate their own way through. But really, even if it looks shiny and good, if you built it, it has no longevity in the light of eternity. Somebody, you can say ouch there, maybe not amen. Amen. And so this is 32 small chapters, very practical with some application and prayer at the end of every chapter. And uh, Judah's going to be on the table at the back to help you with that. And, uh, and then I, I, this is the first book I wrote. And I felt the Lord tell me in 2018 to kind of rewrite it, kind of just refresh it and bring it back out. It's called Rouse the Warriors. And it's a, a prophetic call to boldly advance the kingdom of God. Um, last year, Esther and I had the privilege of giving 9,000 of these at one meeting. Um, the, the, it's a New Frontiers youth event, New Day. And I was asked to speak there, and I felt the Lord saying, give one to every young person free of charge. And I was like, Lord, how do we do that? That's expensive. Uh, but we were able to do it. And I just feel like it's, even though I wrote it quite a few years ago, I've brought it back out, and I've just felt the Lord really say it's a word for now. Now's when those warriors are needed. It's all about how to build in a strength, how to be stronger on the inside than on the outside, how to get healed if you've been wounded, characteristics of the end-time army. Um, you can probably tell I'm quite a simple person, so my books are very easy to read and uh, practical. And then we've got a journal as well called um, Judah's going to come and grab these so I've got some space so that's just a revival ready journal beginning of the year keep your notes and see what the Lord's saying to you I know I was doing a book plug but I'm actually preaching to you I hope you know that um, it's is it helping yes. so uh, I, yeah I had a message which is the word I have for 2024 to share with you I may get there uh, just bear with me Where I'm going to start, though, before I get there, I only felt this during the worship, is is just set a little bit of context. How many know if you understand what time it is, then you know what you ought to do? Uh, First Chronicles, uh, chapter 12, verse 32. The men of Issachar, they understood the times, and they knew what Israel should do. And so before I, if I get there, before I tell you what 2024 is, in terms of what God's been saying to us and how we need to respond... Let me set context for this decade that we're in. So we're four years in. Um, you know, we, well, you could say in some ways we're five years in because of 20, 21, 22, 23. Now we're getting into the fifth one, 24. Um, the, the 2020 started with a stop, a hard, sudden stop. I, I actually think it wasn't designed by the enemy. It was designed by the Lord. 
I don't believe COVID was from God, and I don't believe sickness is from God. I'm just saying God used the circumstances to stop an overactive church, to get our attention. The churches had uh, attention deficit disorder. Seriously, we, we, the ability to listen to the Lord, to be still on the inside, to be still and know that he is God, to stop our activity, it is almost impossible for people. In our quiet times, turn the iPad on, turn the phone on, look on Instagram, check my email. And the Lord is saying, can you not give me an hour without being distracted? Ministry is the same. One program to the next program, one project to the next. And the demands in ministry are huge. Uh, it used to be that you were just a pastor, and now you're really a CEO. You're running accounts and buildings and charity commission. Just the demands are so huge. And so in the midst of it, the Lord gave us a gift. He said, stop. Stop your activity and the primary purpose, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. I remember in uh, end of March 2020, I was sitting down, I was turning the news on, and Boris and the chief medical officer were about to do a live update. It was, wasn't that weird. Every night. So it was like this five or six nights in. It was really surreal. As I'm about to sit on the sofa, the Lord says to me, he said, you should be listening to what I am saying, not to what they are saying. And it was just such a wake-up call. And it was at that point, everything over the next four years just took off. We increased our prayer time. We spent more time with the Lord in that way. We journaled everything. Just in the first six weeks, I think, there's a little group of us meeting on Zoom and some of us in our locality. Uh, I think more than um, 50 or 60 typed pages of what God was saying. From scripture, from visions, from dreams, revelation just coming to us. I'm going to give you like, this is like, really is headlines. The book covers it in detail, Revival Ready, with application of what it means. But here's how I would split up the decade. Um, stop, then a reset, then there's a recalibration taking place, then there will be a release, and then there'll be time to run. Really interesting. Stop was to get our attention, to make sure we're listening to the Spirit. Down tools, listen to the Lord. And people did it well for about three months. And then they were itchy to get going again. And many of the things that the Lord spoke in that three months were soon put to one side as soon as we could return to the comfort of the familiar that we were used to. Are you, are you tracking with me? Here's the problem with Reformation. Um, it is ever so unsettling. When the Lord starts to move in re reforming, reshaping, it feels uncomfortable. Why? We haven't been that way before. We all say amen to those sermons, Joshua 1, we're going to cross over, you've not been this way before, and we all get really excited. But when you go the way that you haven't been before, you feel very vulnerable. So imagine me in my late 40s, in 2016, we'd built um, a thousand-seat auditorium. We picked seats that were wider than most with um, memory foam so you're comfortable. So it actually turned out to about 850, 900 seats. Huge facility. Um, we retained our own old buildings. So here I am, we've got that. We've planted campuses. And we've got about eight campuses. And then we've got a growing family of churches around the UK, in the States, into Europe and India. I think in my late 40s, I've kind of, we're headed in the right direction. I'll give the next 20 years to just build this thing. Do you know what the Lord said to me in that 2020? He said, you are not fit for purpose. He said, you are, and I'll give you the exact words because it, it was pretty, uh, I didn't feel he was angry with me, just to let you know. Um, he, he said this, he said, you are not fit for purpose. You are too personality driven. 
too platform oriented, Sunday centric, and consumer focused. And I was like, I thought I was doing well. <laughs> and he said, because of it, you've produced consumers and not disciples. They're like your building, they're like your preaching, they're like your worship, they're like your childcare, you help them find a parking spot, we try and make the service just right. The Lord says, I never called you to do any of that. You are not there to appease consumers. But every, and I, I, I'm fighting back, and I'm saying, Lord, that's not true. We long for your presence. We want you there. But the reality was what he was saying was true. We were not obeying the Great Commission. And if I searched the depths of my heart, I wanted to do better than the church down the road. But I would never say it. Come on. We love them. We've given finances to most churches in our city. We've helped people with their buildings. So we've got a generous heart. We've done all of that. And, and the Lord really had me to task. So that first season was all about stopping. I'm not going to preach it off the notes. I'll give it you in 10 minutes and I'll get to the word for this year. It was about stopping, paying attention to what the Spirit is saying. It's 16 times in the New Testament. Jesus says... He who has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Most people don't know what the Spirit is saying. Um, then the reset, um, I, I haven't got my phone up here, but if I, I'll borrow your phone just for one second. Thank you so much. I don't need to make a call. You can leave it off. Um, hello? She's busy now. Um, uh, have you ever had a problem with a phone and it's gone glitchy? Yes. And I remember having to take my phone into the shop, and you hear these very awkward words. I'm sorry, sir. Um, we're going to have to do a hard factory reset. Anybody ever heard those words? You will lose. This is before cloud. You will lose all of your preferences, personal preferences, and the phone will be restored back to manufacturer's original settings. So first we went through a stop. And then the Lord is saying, I'm, I'm resetting the church back to creator's original design. I ask myself, how did we get to where we are? <laughs> in all the denominations. How did we get there? How do I have a New Testament in my hand, read that, and then I look at the church in its various forms and say, how do we get from that to this? I'm not going to mention all the list of the things. You can work that out. But I feel what the Lord is doing is resetting his church. And there are those that are right in and going for it. And there are those that are resisting. Let me read you a prophecy right there. I was I, again, just while sat in worship, the Lord reminded me of this prophecy. This is a prophecy that was given in 1987. Some of you weren't even alive in 1987. I was, I was 13 or 14 years old. And it was by a guy called Pastor David Minos in the States on April the 6th, 1987. He said, the Spirit of God would say to you that the wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing through the land. The church, however, is incapable of fully recognizing this wind. Just as your nation has given names to its hurricanes, so I put my name on this wind the wind shall be named holiness unto the Lord. Now, this was given 40 years ago or 30-something years ago, but I believe it's appropriate for today. First wind, holiness unto the Lord. Because of a lack of understanding, some of my people will try to find shelter from the wind, but in so doing, they shall miss my work. For this wind has been sent to blow through every church that names my name. It shall blow through every institution that has been raised in my name, and in those institutions that have substituted their name for mine, they shall fall by the impact of my wind. Those institutions shall fall like a cardboard shack in a gale. Ministries that have not walked in uprightness before me shall be broken and fall. For this reason, man will be tempted to brand this as a work of Satan. But do not be misled. This is my wind. I cannot tolerate my church in its present form, nor will I tolerate it. 
Ministries and organizations will shake and fall in the face of this wind. And even though some will seek to hide from this wind, they shall not escape it. It shall blow against your lives and all around you. It will appear to, to leave crumbling. And so it will. But never forget that this is my wind, says the Lord. With tornado force, it will come, appear to leave devastation. But the word of the Lord comes and says, turn your face to the wind and let it blow. <laughs> For only that which is not of me shall be devastated. And you must see this as necessary. Be not dismayed, for after this my wind will blow again. Have you not read how my breath blew on the valley of dry bones? So it shall breathe on you. This wind will come in equal force as the first wind. This wind will also have a name, and it shall be called the kingdom of God. It shall bring my power. The supernatural shall come in that wind. The world will laugh at you because of the devastation of the first wind, but they will laugh no more. For this wind, the second one, will come with force and power and will produce the miraculous among my people. And the fear of God shall fall on the nation. My people will be willing in the day of my power, says the Lord. In my first wind that is upon you now, I will blow out pride, lust, greed, competition, and jealousy. And you will feel devastated. But haven't you read, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So out of your poverty of spirit, I will establish my kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Know this also. Here's, the, here's why I was reminded of it while I was just talking. Know this also. There'll be those who shall seek to hide from the first wind and then try to flow with the second wind. But they will again be blown away by it. Only those who have turned their faces into this present wind will be allowed to be propelled by the second wind. You have longed for revival and a return to the miraculous and the supernatural. Your generation shall see it, but it shall only come by my process, says the Lord. The church of this nation cannot contain my power in its present form. But as it turns to the wind of the holiness of God, it shall be purged and changed to contain my glory. This is judgment, and it's begun in the house of God, but it is not the end. When the second wind has come and brought in my harvest, then the end shall come. Hmm. Amen. <laughs> Go home. No. Yeah, Father, we just pause for a moment. Again, just remembering that you're a father of love. You're kind, you're gracious, but you're also holy and to be feared. You're the faithful witness. You are Adonai, Almighty. You're the only one that has no beginning and no end. And Lord, we've, we've trifled with you many times. We've tried to play you. And um, forgive us. We say, Lord, we trust your leadership. So for anybody who wants to say amen, you can. But we just say we turn our face towards you. Because you're a good father. <laughs> and we just say anything that you want to blow out, let it go out. Even if it appears like devastation for us, we embrace that which you have for us. In Jesus' name. We just, in you know, the last four years, you, you go from a church in Wolverhampton of about 1,200 people, the building and then campuses and churches, and you suddenly, over four years, families keep saying, hey, we love you, we love your preaching, we just don't get what you're doing, so we're going off to that church just like half a mile down the road. When a few hundred people do that, it really hurts. And the amount of times I said to the Lord, Lord, just let me do what I know to do. I know how to work a crowd, 
I know how to get the services running. You know, pre-COVID, we had a staff team of about 22 people. It's probably about 15 right now. We made some adjustments for the new shape of what we're doing. And, and there was a tension in me during 2021 of, I want to go back to what I know. It took me 30 years to perfect those skills. And I remember wrestling in February 21, am I willing to pioneer unknown territory again in my late 40s, now into my 50s? And I realized I wasn't the pioneer I thought I was. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. In my 20s, I had nothing to lose because I had no reputation, we had no great. But once you've built something and then the Lord says, let me blow on it, then you've got everything to lose, then you've got to decide, shall I just hold on to it as long as I can and work it like I know how to work it? And I, the honest truth is, you suffer financially when the Lord blows, you suffer reputationally, I mean everything. The losses, I can't tell you, and I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, I'm not looking for a, oh. um, how many nights, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., midnight, 3 a.m., I couldn't sleep. And my only safe place was to come downstairs, sit at the kitchen table, open my Bible, and begin to pray. And this is the truth. Normally within five minutes, the presence of the Lord would just flood me. He would remind me of what he said. He'd strengthen my heart. And probably the most radical thing my wife and I have done in the last four years, through the painful pioneering, and we watched the Lord dismantle. I think we've just entered this month into actually, a, this is my word for the year. It's a, it's a year of strength. It's a, 2024 is a year to grow strong. It's a year to increase capacity. It's a, it's a year to just everything's going to become stronger. Like, uh, personally, I'm feeling it already. And the strength coming to me in times of prayer. I'll give you that in just a moment. But he, here's what we did for four years. Esther and I, and I don't know what you do with this in broadcasting. I'm not trying to show off at all. I think you're getting a measure of me. We made a commitment in May 2020. We prayed our alarm would go off at 3.50 a.m., We'd be downstairs by 4 a.m. and we'd pray for two hours every day. We thought we'd do it during the lockdown. Do you know what? We haven't stopped doing that. We played with the timings a little bit. So for three, just over three years, it was four till six. And then last June, we just adjusted it to do six till eight. And now we've readjusted it again to go five till about seven or eight. And I'm making another adjustment to think, I think I'm going to have to go back to four and maybe go through till about 8.39, because the Lord is saying, no, I need more time with you if you're going to do what I've called you to do. Because reformers, pioneers, revivalists are not made on platforms. They're made in the secret place with God, where he starts dealing with hearts and motives, purifying, cleansing. So, okay, take a deep breath and say, it's going to be okay, he's going home soon. Um, so I, I haven't even I've just given you stop and reset so I'll, I'll give you a sentence on the, recalibrate is the Lord saying how do you measure success he says you need to recalibrate how you measure success it is not by how big your building is how many people attend there's a lot of people attending churches who are not actually going to go to heaven I don't know if you know that. And yet they've got their hands raised, they're doing stuff. It's going to be the biggest shock of our life. So if I'm celebrating more people in the building, it's not the measure. It's not how many people are inviting me out to do stuff and preach. And it's not how many books I sell. And the Lord said to us, go back to the New Testament, use their measure. Um, are we obeying what Jesus called us to do? He said, go make disciples. How many of our community are actually actively making disciples? There's a measure. I never hear any church leader tell me how they're doing in disciple making. It's nearly always around the, um, the metrics that nearly every church in the UK and in America is using. It's the size of the building, the size of the budget, the size of the crowd. 
And I, that just isn't part of God's measurement. I, so don't get me wrong. I believe stadium Christianity is coming back. So I'm, I'm not into everything's going to be really small. I actually think we're going to hit, uh, uh, it might be 10 years from now, it might be 15, it could be 20. But there's going to come a day where our building's not big enough and we're going to have to take stadiums to do what God is calling us to do. But Christianity won't be defined what happens in the stadium. Um, so there's a recalibration. Obedience to Christ, uh, obedience to the Great Commission, obedience to the Great Commandment, uh, obedience to Jesus' commands in the Gospels, 107 of them, but most Christians don't know any of them. Like They should matter if Jesus told us to do things. And, uh, you know, so, so there's a whole load of recalibrating that needs to go. And we're going to detail in the book. So stop, reset, recalibrate. Then there's a season of release. We've lived through all of this, but I think we're pioneering and the Lord's letting us move up just slightly ahead so that we can hold out a hand and help thousands of others in the next five years. And so the season of release is, is really where the Lord says, now get ready, put this in place, this in place, because then the last word is run. And for us, we feel like that starts a year from now. So we're still straddling that season of release. And the Lord gave me five things under the season of release, which I don't have time to tell you right now. It's a message by itself. Um, but I'll give you one point out of the five, which is my word for this year. I felt the Lord speak this to me for 2024. He says, you're entering a season of divine impartation. And these were the exact words. And I won't tell you, I had, I had it in an encounter with the Lord. This might sound weird, with two angels placing hands on my back. It doesn't happen to me. I'm not that person. Sat in a chair, shaking like a leaf, which also physical manifestations isn't something I normally have. And so I'm having this massive encounter, and the Lord gives me these five points. And the last point was, you're entering a season of divine impartation. I will strengthen your voice. And it will shift things in communities. I'll strengthen your legs and you will run through the nations. I will strengthen your eyes and you'll have prophetic perspective. And I'll strengthen your ears and you'll be able to hear things even from other spaces thousands of miles away or from other time periods that you can pull into today. Sounds weird, I get it, but just... And I, I had it like two years ago, but in November, the Lord said that word in January 21 is actually for 2024. It's, it, how many know you get prophetic words and you think it's for then, you hold on to it and you realize God says, no, five years from now, I was just giving you a heads up. So my question to the Lord was, and I believe it wasn't just a word for me. I believe it's a word for the church in 2024. And the Lord is saying, I want to make you strong. You're going to need the strength. It's not just, oh, anybody want to be strong. It's like what is coming is going to be requiring of us to be strong. So my question to the Lord was, how do I get this? Like, is there anything I need to do or is it just going to happen? And I felt the Lord say this extended periods of time with me and I will give it to you as a gift. Wow. That's a good word. You can't earn it, but he said, you give me more time, extended periods of time in the word, in prayer, in worship, in fasting, and I will give it to you. And as I've meditated and prayed on it, he's taken me to Daniel 1. And you know, Daniel 1, Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. And when they tested him against his, his age group from other nations, they found Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be stronger and healthier than the other people. A few verses later, it says, and the Lord gave Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He imparted to them the ability to interpret dreams and visions and understand riddles. And it just goes on. It's the Lord that gave it to him. But listen to what Daniel did. Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the culture of the day. I don't know if you understand. He was stolen as a captive from his homeland, taken to a foreign country that he doesn't know the language in for some reason because of his um, nobility. He's only a teenager, but because of his smarts, 
he's actually allowed to come into the court and he's going to be trained as a wise person in the court. And he can eat their food, food that's been sacrificed to idols. So he's in this culture, having been taken from his home. And as a teenager, he purposes, I don't want to eat your food. I don't want to worship your idols. I'm not going to go there. How many know, as a captive in war, you get killed for stuff like that? (laughs) There's a strong resolution for consecration and holiness. And I think, even though the Bible doesn't make this explicit in this chapter, it does later in the book, that that 10 days and water and vegetables was actually his first annual fast. And the Lord honored him and made him stronger and healthier and fitter than anybody else. He rewarded him. And, and actually, by the time their mental acuity is tested, the, the Bible says they are 10 times wiser, not than their age group, than any other enchanter or wise man in the whole province, in the whole land. Teenagers are suddenly 10 times wiser. Why? Because God gave it to them as a gift. Why did he give it to them as a gift? I believe it's in direct response They touch the heart of God by purposing to keep themselves holy, going into a season of prayer, and in a culture that was going one way, they decided to stay God's way at the risk of their own lives. And so Daniel goes right into his 80s with never compromising his life. If you want a book to read, you know, just in one sitting, Daniel would be that book right now. Read it in one sitting. And just see, I think at least twice, maybe three times, when an angel visits Daniel, says to Daniel, Daniel, you who are highly beloved of the Lord. Angels don't say that. They normally come and just give a message. But to Daniel, man who is highly esteemed, man who is highly loved, like three times, I think. They don't just come with a message from God. Number one, he's getting heaven's attention like this. The moment you prayed, we, wanted, we were sent to answer. It's like he has heaven's attention. Why? Because he purposed not to defile himself. He lived a life of prayer. You couldn't buy him. Do you know when Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son who became king, said, give, I'll give you a robe and I'll give you a gold chain and I'll give you this. He says, keep your gifts. Let me tell you what that says. He, he wasn't for sale. He could not be manipulated. He was just solid on, I'll serve God whether we live or where we die. Remember their response in Daniel chapter 3? O king, live forever. Um, Whether our, our God is able to save us, but even if he doesn't decide to save us, we will not bow down. <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious? You'd lose your life on standing on principle right now. So I, I know my time's almost gone, and I didn't get to my the message I had prepared for you, which is really around divine strength. But it comes in, so practically, what does it look like? Um, I want to be stronger. I'll guarantee you, by God's grace, if I showed up here in December, one year from now, or January next year, I will not be the same person. My father has promised me, and there's an invitation to the church, I'll give you 10 times the reward I normally give. I'm like, who? you would be crazy to not say yes to that. Now, you know, if you prayed for five minutes, there's a reward. If you read three verses, there's a reward. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, Hebrews 11.6. He always rewards. But if he's saying, in this year, I'll give you 10 times what I normally give, wouldn't you be saying, I'm not watching Netflix this year? Not like for seven days. We start a 21-day fast on Sunday. But Esther and I have already worked out the whole year and said, if this is a year, and this is my personal conviction, the Lord has said to me, you've been through four years of dismantling and pain. You're going through one year of strengthening. And then I'll let you run for 20 years without having to stop. And I've been like, okay, I'm ready for that. Because I've just been like... I, you know, I've kept traveling. I'm, I, the Lord's just been very kind to allow me to keep ministering because it's a source of strength to me as well. But actually, it's always been like we're holding back. We're holding back. And the Lord's saying, not yet, not yet. Don't do this yet. Don't, don't push out just yet. 
But he's saying to me, you, do, you handle this year well. You lay the foundations. You bide your time. You develop a life of prayer. You learn to fast as a rhythm for 20 years. And he says, I'll reward you in ways that you, you will become the man you dreamed of. You will become the woman you dreamed about. You will, you will be unrecognizable. Little lusts and little demons that have controlled you, their power will be broken. Not because the Lord broke their power. It's just you, you grew too strong for them to hold on to. It's some things you've just got to grow up out of. You know, the face of Christianity is changing right now. And if people are going to defend the old, it's, you can, but it'll suddenly become totally irrelevant because the markers and everything are going to shift and change. And so the th my time's gone. Here would have been my three. This is where I would have lived. I would have given you that as an introduction. And then I would have said, here's three things to focus in on for this coming year. Number one, your prayer life. Like, get out a calendar, put in that calendar when you're going to pray. Like, there's no other shortcut. So my son's with me. We love gymming together. He's 18. But he was actually pressing more reps on his chest this morning than I was. I still did the same way. I just couldn't get the same amount of reps out. It's not fair. Um, but tomorrow morning, I know it's a late night tonight. I know I've got a pattern with the Lord for about three hours. Then we go to the gym, then we go to breakfast, and then I go and do a leaders meeting at 10 o'clock. And I'm just like, I'm just going to live the rhythm and the pattern that the Lord wants. I don't think, oh, we're traveling. Let's just cancel that bit. I have nothing to give if I've not been with him. And so I, I would just want to encourage you, when are you going to fast? When are you going to pray? And I was going to give you four things under prayer. Number one, you pray for intimacy. The main purpose for prayer is just Intimacy. Being with him, loving on him. I'm not giving you the scriptures. I can send my notes to Pastor John, and then you can make them available to people if you want to do that. Um, so the first reason is for intimacy. The second reason would be to increase your wisdom and your understanding, because God will give it to you. I can't tell you how much the Lord wants to give people wisdom and understanding about the times in which we live. Um, oh... It's like a message by itself. If you will spend time with the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit for a few hours, He will start to give you revelation. No, don't go in with your agenda. Don't go in with a prayer list. Just start walking and praying. And you've just set aside an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. And you just... Oh, rabo koto reke sabro sunda kambra kanda resitat... You may struggle for the first 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, and then all of a sudden, you'll open up into a spirit of wisdom and revelation, and the Holy Spirit will start getting you to pray for certain things. Um, the five days before the, the new year, I wanted to do something different. I said to Esther, how about we pray from midnight till 2 a.m., but we don't do it at home. We go into our prayer hub. We have a 24-7 prayer hub. Invite a few others, see if they want to come, and let's just see what the Lord does. So we close off the year strong. This is how crazy what Before that, the Lord had told us to do a 21-day fast. Before that, in November, the Lord had told us to do a 21-day fast. And we do another one in January. Like, I'm just like in a few days' time. It, this is, we're not playing games. We are like going all out. And when you start doing that, your spirit becomes the strongest part of you. And it's like Googling God. <laughs> uh, the, the, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Spirit searches out the deep things of God. And then you tap into heavenly wisdom that you can pull into this age. But it doesn't come through somebody preaching it to you. You've got to develop that personal history. So you grow in intimacy uh, as the first thing. Then you grow in wisdom and understanding. Thirdly, you grow. You will find when you start doing that, your own spirit will start changing shape. You can't see that, but you'll feel it. You'll feel the strength on the inside. You'll walk a bit differently. You'll come into a work. If you pray two, three, four hours regularly, if you learn to worship, I'm really not trying to show off, but I think sometimes telling people what we're doing gives them something to say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because in, in the UK, we've been so weak in our devotional commitment. 
I said to my wife, and she said yes, and my other son, uh, Joel, who's 20 years old, he's doing this as well. We're reading the Bible in 60 days. So I've made a commitment, January and February, read the whole Bible through, and I'm up to date right now. But we're only on the 4th of Jan, so that's not too difficult. I just thought, I've never done that. I know people who are doing it. Now, I'll do it for two months, and if I can sustain it, I'll do it the whole year. So read the whole Bible through six times, and then on top of that, I've got a few other things that I'm doing, so in terms of Bible reading. Again, I'm not telling you this to put you off or raise the bar too high. I'm just saying reading one verse while eating a piece of toast and walking out the house is not going to help you build the capacity that you need. Or I've got Premier playing in the car, so I'm okay. I listen to that lady who gives me the devotion every morning, and I'm all good to go. The Lord is saying, no, I have given you a spirit, and that spirit needs to develop strength in the place of prayer, in the place of the word. And then the fourth area that you'll find in prayer is that you will be able to turn some battles at the gate in the place of prayer. The Lord will have you contend for things. They might be in your family. They might be over your own life. They might be over relatives. It could be over a region or a nation. But you'll come into times in prayer where, yes, you spend time in worship, and yes, you're growing on the inside, and yes, wisdom is coming. But actually, he'll put it on you to contend for certain things, and you'll turn the battle at the gate. All the scriptures are in my notes. I'll send them, and you can look them through. So prayer is the first one. Secondly, um, and this is huge in this season, um, I, I would say you need to nurture unity. doesn't sound sexy. The enemy operates through division. The enemy operates through competitiveness, through jealousy, through accusation. And, and what the Lord, again, I don't have time for it. I'm not going to, this is, we do a lot of regional leadership events around the UK. Um, early in February, we're in Kingston in London with a group of leaders there. And I know that the remit is invite them to pray. Teach them about regional unity. Regional unity starts by me being in unity with the Father, at one with him, and then being one with my wife, and then holding a unity in my family, and then learning in my leadership team to nurture unity. It's, it's, I can't tell you how powerful it is. Then it infiltrates the whole church, then churches with churches. And before you know it, this is what's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years. You're going to see regions that are in unity across the denominations. And what will happen is they'll become a shield, invisible to the enemy, attracting heavenly things to them because of their oneness. So it'll be a shield and a magnet, and it will become a seed bed that you, things that wouldn't grow in the kingdom in that area before, suddenly everybody gets to experience this huge growth. It's a seedbed of fertile creativity, of heaven coming, angelic visitations, ideas. It becomes easy to live under that shield because of the oneness that they are experiencing. So we've got, maybe you need to ask somebody to forgive you. Maybe there's some offense to deal with. Never pick up accusation uh, and throw it as an arrow at other people. There's a whole message in that. In the ministry of accusation or the ministry of intercession. Pick up an arrow and throw it or stand in the gap and intercede. Jesus on the cross, when they were accusing him, he let their accusations come into him and they died. And then he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. He didn't accuse back. He didn't defend himself. He just absorbed their immaturity, and intercession rose from him up to the Father. Now, I don't know about you. When somebody accuses me, I'm quick with my mouth. I can give good back. Like, I'm, I'm quite witty. I can come back at something. And the Lord is saying, not anymore. You learn to let that thing die in you. And the bigger you get, the more you can absorb and it's always the mature that suffer for the immature. The enemy's tactic moved through misunderstanding, moved through unfulfilled promises, uh, un unmet expectations. We do not have the luxury of accusing one another and of bringing disunity. And then the third thing, so prayer, unity, and the third one is a call to consecration. I've touched it already, but the... Uh, um, Without holiness, Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 
And yet the Beatitudes, the pure in heart, will see God. And, and I'm telling you, the men and women that are coming are not going to be the greatest preachers who have the greatest authority. It'll be the humble, the pure in heart, those who are consecrated. What does consecration mean? If you're in the Anglican church and they have a cup that they serve communion in, they would say that cup is consecrated. There's only one use for it. It sits on the altar and it's to serve communion. It's consecrated for one purpose. When we talk about our consecration, we come and present our bodies as a living sacrifice and we say we are yours. You don't fit into my already full, nice middle class life. No, my whole life now is orientated towards you. I am holy to you. And it's a love devotion. So I want to live in a manner worthy of the cross. That's where the power is in consecration. But you combine those three things together, that's where your strength is. And you give the Lord extended periods of time. My oldest son got married in November. Him and his wife are living in our house. Judah lives in with us. Me and my wife are there. All day today, Esther's been looking after Talitha. Talitha Praise is my um, uh, our granddaughter. Oh, I haven't got a photo here. It's on my phone. I was going to show you a baby photo. She's, she's like 19 months old. Uh, isn't that a great smile? Uh, and she loves walking around and just saying, Papa, Papa, Papa. Uh, why am I saying all of that? 15 staff to manage churches around the UK. I am not a monk living in isolation with no responsibilities, thinking I've got all the time in the world. I'm like you. Massive demands on my time, on my money, family, church. I mean, last night in a meeting till late with our leadership team all day, busy with meetings. I, I was actually on a global call with leaders just before I came here. So upstairs in, uh, in the office uh, from 7 till 7.40, preaching to them and then walked into the worship service to be with you. Um, so I, I, I only say that to say all of us can give ourselves excuses why it's all right for him, he's got time. <laughs> None of us have the time. All of us have many demands on our time. But if I had a call for you, like I, power surge, like um, I, I, I loved everything uh, Pastor John was saying, and I do think there are moments the Spirit moves and He gives divine impartation. It's a very similar word, but I would say it's actually less of a surge, and it's more of a obedience response, and then He gives you this as a gift. But as you look back, suddenly you think, where did all this come from? How did it happen? And it was in your love response to the Father. All of it is relational. All of it. And it's beautiful. It's not works. It's not legalism. It's a manner worthy of the cross. So can I pray for you? Yes. Uh, have I helped anybody this evening? Yes. Okay. So... Father, we love you. I'm not a long-winded. I was then, but I was told I had an hour and I took an hour, so I, I, I'm very obedient. Um, so, Father, here we are. We love you. We turn our hearts towards you. I thank you all through this evening. You've been talking to people, touching hearts and lives. We're extremely grateful for your kindness towards us. tell you what I'm going to do. If the Lord has spoken to you in any way tonight, I'm not going to do an altar call out here, but wherever you are, if you want to respond to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are, and then I'm going to pray Isaiah 11 and verse 2 over you, which is the seven uh, spirits of God, the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit. And I, it, the truth is, as I've been preaching, the Lord has been imparting like I know that as part of the grace of my life that the moment I stand up and it will increase that the Lord starts to awaken and impart so you will be different from just sitting under the preaching um, because the Holy Spirit has been working. So 
as you stood, just say, here I am, Lord. I'm yours. I trust your leadership. And only if you're willing to say this, you can say, I turn my face into the wind. Blow. Anything that needs to be removed, take it away. You're a good father. I trust you. Thank you that you care for me. And Father, now I want to pray over every person that is stood up in this room. Just look up at me for one moment. Jesus described himself one time. Do you remember how he described himself? He said, I am gentle and lowly. Isn't that amazing? So come to me if you're weary. I think we have so much going on. And he one time describes himself. I think he's beautiful. And so even though I talk about the pain of it, I can honestly say he's been gentle. He's been meek or lowly or humble. He's been so kind. I trust him. Sometimes he's strong in his gentleness. He can come and say, come on, Steve, that's enough. I've heard him say to me, stop mourning. Get up. And I've been like, okay. But I know it's in his grace he's saying that. So I'm not, I'm not wanting you to expect a rough ride. I want you to know that a good heavenly father, a kind Jesus, a gentle Holy Spirit will walk you through whatever the process is for you. And yours will be different to mine. The outcome will be the same. 100% dedication to him. A life of holiness. Radical obedience, quick obedience. And the, the, bottom, the bottom line, the end game, he wants to fully possess you. How beautiful is that? Fully possess you. He doesn't want to share you. And so, Father, I want to pray Isaiah 11, verse 2, the prophecy about Jesus, the sevenfold attributes of the Holy Spirit. And I pray over you that the Spirit of the Lord will rest on you. That you will, I don't know if you see those two connections, the Spirit of the Lord rest. It's, there's no agitation. So we, we submit to your Lordship today. And I pray that the Spirit of the Lord would rest on us, find a resting place. I pray that you would increase in the spirit of wisdom and understanding. I pray that you would know and increase as the Holy Spirit begins to burn by his holy fire inside of you. I pray for an impartation of wisdom and understanding today. I pray that you would grow in counsel and might. I pray that there'd be a growth in the counsel, heavenly counsel. So spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel. I thank you that we can tap into counsel from heaven. I thank you that the Lord is mighty in the counsel of his holy ones. Sorry when we've not prayed in the spirit and sought out your counsel. Sorry when we've run to man or to Google before we've gone to the Lord. Lord, teach us what it is to get the counsel of heaven on situations. I pray the spirit of might into you today. You're going to need the spirit of might or the spirit of power. And I pray that you would know your mind strengthened, your will strengthened, and your emotions strengthened. That there'd be new strength, that your mind won't wonder, your will won't bend, and your emotions will stop going up and down. I pray that there'd be a strength, that out of his supernatural riches, his grace up in heaven, that the Holy Spirit would take from there and strengthen you by his power in your inner being. And then I pray that the Lord will give you knowledge. And it's a supernatural revelation knowledge. You'll just know things. You'll know things about situations, about people, about circumstances, about the future. But it's a revelation knowledge. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, I pray that the spirit of the fear of the Lord would rest upon you. You would know the fear of the Lord in a new way. The next verse tells us that Jesus delights in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a safe place to live. There's joy there. There's safety there. There's comfort there. To walk tenderly in the light of eternity. 
So I pray that you would know that. Again, just look up at me for a moment. These are seven, it's the Holy Spirit. There's seven fires. It's all over the Bible. So it's mentioned there in Isaiah 11. There are seven pillars in the house of wisdom in Proverbs 9. There are seven spirits of God before the throne of God. They're all the same thing. And when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came with those seven fires into you. That's why on the day of Pentecost, flames came on each person. And I, I haven't lived this to the height, but I've had the Lord say it to me in the last two years, the day's coming where you will get to distinguish between the different fires. Like you'll feel a burning and you'll think, oh, that's wisdom coming. Oh, that's understanding. Oh, I feel might rising up on the inside. And you'll know it's for a situation that you're about to walk into. And the day you come, you'll be able to cooperate with the Holy Spirit better than you might do right now. I'm just trying to say the adventure of walking with the Holy Spirit, who is a person. These aren't just fires and power and wisdom and attributes. It's a living person who comes to live inside of you. But we've kept him so small. And as you spend time with him, he'll begin to grow in you. And all of a sudden, these fires. And you know, verse 3 says about Jesus, after it says those seven things, he will not make a decision by what his eyes see or a judgment by what his ears hear. In other words, because he now lives from another realm, wisdom, understanding, and counsel, and might, and fear of the Lord, and he now makes decisions not based on earthly things, eyes and ears. The spirit within him leads him. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the children of God. I mean, there is an adventure awaiting you, but our spirit has been so small. The Lord saying, come. I have so much I want to give to you. Come be with me. Let me strip some things away. Let me enlarge you in some spaces. I'm going to hand back to your team here and, and Pastor John. And um, It's been a delight to be with you this evening. Um, Judah's going to be on that table at the back, and uh, he'll help you in any way that he can. Be kind to him. He's on his own serving there. Um, yeah. Amen. Love you. You've got beautiful faces. You're lovely people. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Purify. Purify. Would you search me and know me, find in me a pure heart? All for your glory, I'm chosen and I'm set apart.
Father, we pray tonight that you'd recalibrate our hearts in this place. Father, we ask that you'd search us in this atmosphere. Realign us to your plans and your ways as we enter into 24 in this season of prayer and fasting. God, we pray align our lives with heaven's plan. Lord, I pray tonight for that impartation of the spirit of prayer and supplication. I pray tonight for a deeper depth in the realm of the spirit that we would begin to carve out time with you, that we'd begin to recalibrate our lives, that we'd make decisions in this atmosphere that would position us for the rest of this year. God, I pray, search us and know us. Uproot the things that are not of you from our lives. We pray again, blow, blow breath of God in this room. Uproot, uproot everything that's not of you. Uproot it, uproot every agenda in our heart tonight, God, that's not of you. Uproot everything that we're investing in that you've not called us to invest in. God, we pray that you'd inspect the tree tonight of our lives. Inspect it. Dig up what's not of you. Dig up what's not of you. We pray as prophets tonight that there'd be an uprooting at the beginning of this year. We pray, Holy Spirit, Come with your breath and uproot the things that are not growing in our lives. God, we pray, even in this house, in this church, we pray, let the eyes of the Lord inspect our hearts in this house. Blow, breath of God. Blow, breath of God. We're asking tonight, put in us clean hands, pure hearts. Remove the dross, oh God. Remove anything that is unclean, any unclean spirit from this house. Let the breath of heaven blow tonight. All selfish ambition, let it fall from us tonight. All pride, let it come down tonight. 
Let our motives be pure. Let our hearts be yielded. Clean hands, pure hearts. Realign our lives to heaven's order. God, I pray where there's a stop needed. God, put a hard stop again. Put a reset again. Put a realignment again. Put a reformation again. Father, we want everything that will take us to another level, oh God. Another level of flow tonight. God, we're praying again. Wherever the surge protector is, break it off us tonight. Whatever is stopping the flow of the Spirit, the flow of your power, God, we pray, remove it tonight. Male Sandebehi. Shalom. We ask for the shalom, the reordering. Peace in everything, the reconstruction. Break us to make us. Break us to make us tonight. Shalom. God, I pray anything out of order. Anything that's broken and healed in the wrong position, God, break it again that it can be made again. Male. Mala. Male. Mele. Kiki. Rababu. Shanda. Bahala. Masia. Mahala. Masoto. Kura. Baye. Kura. Maha. For I say tonight, that I'm blowing again on the leaves of autumn. For the Lord says the leaves have fallen from the tree. And would you allow me to blow away the leaves of a previous season that I could reestablish a new growth in your life? For the Lord says, do not cling to the past, but look to the future. For the autumn has passed and the winter has passed and springtime begins to come forth. For the Lord says, even over the church of the UK, would you allow me to blow again into the leaves of the autumn that I could reestablish a new growth in this nation. For the Lord says, I've not given up and I've not turn my back upon this nation but the Lord says I have pruned the tree in this last season I've removed the dead leaves and I've removed the dead branches that I could once again establish my kingdom purposes in this land for the Lord says do not despise my cutting in your life do not despise my pruning in your life for the Lord says I discipline those that I love And even in the cutting back, the Lord says tonight, I'm preparing you for an acceleration of growth. Even now, new sprouts are beginning to form. Even now, new new branches are beginning to grow that will look even better than before, that will reach even further than before. For the Lord says, even now, I'm preparing you as a new wineskin, ready for new wine. Father, we receive your invitation tonight. An invitation to reformation. We turn our faces to the wind. And we say in this house, blow. Blow the leaves, the dead things of a previous season away from this house. Blow breath of God. Can these bones live again? We prophesy to the dead things tonight. Hear the word of the Lord. These bones will surely live again. We receive the invitation to reformation. We turn our face to the wind. And we say, blow. Blow breath of God. Blow breath of God. Male sile kileme kilamando. Silamende kilamanda silamanda silabende. Silamondo shimondo simende. 
Kimanda, Simando, Shimande, Silamando, Silamende, Silamanda, Silamande, Silamende, Kilamondo, Simondo, Simondo, Simanda, Silamanda, Kilamende, Silamanda, Silamende. Kurama silama silame silamando kilamande kimando simando kimande ralamande silamande kurama sikikike kurama sikirama simando remende simando silamende kilamanda silabende Kura mashima, kura masime, kimando silamande, kilamende, silamende, silamando remende, kimondo. Blow breath of God. Blow the dead things from our lives. Silamanda, kilamando remende, simande, amande, amanda. Simando reme, reme, mando, makara, mande, shimando, remende, simande, amando, ramando, bo, kimande. Blow, blow, let the wind of heaven blow through this place. Blow, breath of God. Sima reme, kima reme, hama romo, momo mende. Sima de kiki. Reestablish. say tonight I believe it's for you Steve but I believe it's also for everyone in this room tonight that I'm placing a fresh rhythm upon your life the Lord says tonight that there was a beat in a previous season that the Lord says I'm beginning to cause to come back to the forefront a rhythm and a sound and at times it's even felt like the beat has been offbeat that's been uncomfortable it's been awkward to those around you it's been awkward even to those in the ministry but the Lord says I'm not calling you to beat the sound of a drum that others are running to but the Lord says I'm calling you to play the sound of a rhythm that others are not running to in this season. And the Lord says it may feel offbeat even to those around you, but the Lord says that the rhythm of the world is going to begin to change. And even though you find yourself offbeat, the Lord says that as the sound around you begins to change, you will find that your beat is the beat of a sound that is needed in this time and this era. For the Lord says, I call you as one that will break ground. I call you as one that will break territory. I call you as one that does not run to the ways of this world but runs to a different sound that originates from heaven and even some have said this is before your time and even some have criticized your direction but the Lord says it's already begun to flourish upon the earth for the Lord says the time that I created for you for is now and your season is now upon you says the Lord for there is surely a run that is beginning to rise on the inside of you and there's a new fire that's 
beginning to rise on the inside of you, says the Lord, for surely you will burn brighter in these next 20 years than you've ever burnt before. For the Lord says, surely there's a new sound that's going to be released from your mouth that's never been heard before. For the Lord says, the beat of my return is getting louder and louder. And you've heard the beat of a different drum. For the Lord says, religion has played its sound, but the Spirit is playing a new sound, says the Lord. And those that have had ears to hear have heard. And he says tonight, son, you've heard a new sound. You've heard a new beat. You've heard a new drum. And it may be offbeat, but the order is changing. And what was offbeat will become the rhythm of the earth as I return. Father, we pray tonight that across this room that we would tune our ears during these seven days to the rhythm that's flowing from heaven. Father, I pray for each and every one of us tonight that we would catch ears in the Spirit to hear the sound originating from heaven. That even if it's not popular in modern Christianity, even if it's not trendy on YouTube, God, I pray for each and every one of us that we'd begin to hear the beat of a different drum. That YouTube and Instagram would not be our source of theology, but your word and prayer. Your word and prayer would be the sound that we begin to pull from into our spirits. Blow breath of God. Blow everything off us that we don't need in 24. And let only what remains be of you a different beat in 24. I said a different beat, a different rhythm for your life in 24. Over this room, a different rhythm to their spiritual journeys. We're asking for that tonight. Prayer, unity, Mali, Mala. Make us one, Jesus, tonight. Break every spirit of division. Make us one in this house tonight, Jesus. Mali, impartation. Kuda mahala masura bahala maha. Make as one as you are one. Fulfill your prayer in our time, in our day, in our age. Make us one, Jesus. Let us lay down all pettiness. Mali, silemi, kilamondo, silamandi. Have your way, Jesus. Blow. Blow, breath of God. Consecrate us tonight. Purify us tonight. Make us holy tonight. Blow on us, Jesus. Let us never be the same again. Let 24 be a defining year in our lives, in every person in this room. Don't let these be just other messages. Let there be a shift. Realigning. To a new river. Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Can we give Steve some love tonight? (laughs) Hallelujah. And can you give Jesus some love in this place as well? (laughs) Hallelujah. Can you?
just love on our worship team. She leads worship. Reach out a hand. May the outrageous love of the Father, the extravagant grace of Master Jesus, and the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Your best days are ahead of you. God's not finished with you yet. You're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. As you put your heart into the word and prayer, this is going to be your year where you move from ankle deep to out of control, a raging river, a surge. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, give the Lord one more clap tonight. We love you. We appreciate you. We're back again tomorrow night, 7.30. Sheely's are back in the house. You probably worked it out. Emma Stark is here tomorrow night as well. If you're coming back tomorrow, give me a wave. Who's back tomorrow? Hallelujah. Okay. Tell your friends. Post on Instagram. Let's get this.